Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Sister Janet Eisner, President of Emmanuel College, and it's a privilege to gather with you for an extraordinary discussion with one of the world's leading visionaries in business and the life sciences, Dr. Nuba Afeng. Joining us are members of the Emmanuel College community, as well as dignitaries from organizations including biomedicine, finance, architecture, real estate, philanthropy. We're so honored that you are here with us. This special event is part of a series sponsored by the Emanuel College Business Collaborative, led by Associate Dean of Business and Management, Anne Marie Pasquale. The collaborative blurs the lines between the classroom and the real world, equipping students with the analytical tools and decision-making skills to serve as effective and ethical business leaders. I'm especially grateful to Anne Marie for serving as moderator for this afternoon's discussion. Emmanuel's programs in the sciences have grown dramatically in scope and reputation over the last few decades. Today, our faculty, in collaboration with students, are conducting world-class research, and our graduates are entering prestigious graduate programs locally and throughout the country, often aided by the internships that they, that you, have had at our neighboring Longwood institutions. What is more, as a Catholic college rooted in the liberal arts and sciences, Emmanuel stands at the crossroads of timeless values and the critical issues of our time. All of which is why we are especially eager to hear the perspective of our distinguished guest. Dr. Nuba Afayan is founder and CEO of Flagship Pioneering and co-founder and chairman of Moderna, a Cambridge-based company that changed the world by developing a revolutionary vaccine for COVID-19. Dr. Fayen holds a PhD in biomedical engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and is a member of the corporation of MIT, the Institute's governing board. Throughout his impressive career, Dr. Fayen has co-founded and helped establish over 75 life science companies demonstrating his commitment to improving the human condition through science and business. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nuba Afeng. College here today. Our students are interested in hearing about your success, your thoughts on innovation and investing and entrepreneurship. So I'll ask some questions and then after a little bit we'll put it out to the audience. How's that? Super. Great to be here. So um, our students um, come from many different family backgrounds. Can you tell us a little bit about your own? Sure. So um, I was born in Lebanon of, of Armenian descent. Um, it was a great place to grow up till I was 13 years old, except for a minor problem, which was a civil war broke out. And the civil war, when you're 13 years old, kind of takes what you see on, in movie theaters and brings it to the streets, not in a way that you'd like. Uh, for a period of several months, we were going in and out of bunkers. We would see rocket fire across from our, from our balcony where I lived in Beirut. Uh, a lot of people died, the building next to us completely collapsed. And after that, uh, my father fortunately decided that this would probably not end very soon, and so he moved our family to Canada. Canada was generous enough to take us essentially as, as political refugees, because it wasn't like they would allow anybody to just leave every country and go anywhere they want. Uh, so we were fortunate. Overnight, I got to see snow. I had never seen snow before, if you grew up in the Middle East. That's also something you see on television. Uh, and uh, so I grew up in Montreal from, from that age through college, uh, which was a good kind of, in hindsight, I realized now it was a very important experience because it forced me to adapt 
to a completely different life suddenly. And then from Montreal, I came to, to MIT to do my PhD. And essentially, since 1987, I've been involved in starting companies and innovating in the life sciences. Um, I continue to be to have uh, some level of involvement in with my kind of uh, ethnic background as an Armenian. Armenia is a country that 30 years ago uh, found some form of uh, freedom from the Soviet Union, uh, and it, was, it became a really poor country uh, again, but a, but a free country somewhat. And so I've been involved in the last 20 years alongside my work at Flagship and doing a lot of philanthropic projects there, development projects there, which has also been an interesting juxtaposition with doing startups in, in the US and country development halfway across the world because you realize that, you know, kind of dealing with poverty and food insecurity and, and many other big issues is a very different thing than developing scientific breakthroughs and, and, and things. But then at some level in the last year, which we can come to, the pandemic has kind of almost brought that level of desperation to the whole world. And so it's been an interesting merger of those two threads of my life, mm -hmm. suddenly going from thinking that, you know, uh, humanitarian work is only done in certain places in the world to realizing that humanitarian work is needed everywhere under certain, certain, certain circumstances. So anyway, that's a little bit of background on that. So it sounds as if, um, or you could tell us how your immigrant experience has influenced this path you've taken. Would you say it's had a strong, powerful influence in your path? It's had a powerful influence in, in, on my path, but less consciously until a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, that a few years ago, actually, um, I was I was honored by the, the International Institute of New England. They have this thing they do. It's the first time I ever, except getting an honor, it was nothing to do with the pandemic. It had to do with just all the work I've done with uh, issues, you know, kind of, uh, again, issues of immigration. And it just started, I started reflecting on how important it has been in hindsight in my life. Um, I, I remember, so if you, if you have an immigrant experience, you always feel like an outsider. And so in this country, I kind of, I came to this country uh, because I wanted to be in this country. It's not because I was born here. And that's a very different level of commitment. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, and so I remember coming to MIT and in the first few weeks, uh, I remember, in hindsight, this poster that was on their, their infinite corridor, this long, uh, 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 very iconic thing at MIT. And one of the student posters basically was this Indian chief faces 1983, facing you with a finger out saying, who are you calling foreigner pilgrim? And I remember walking by there every day thinking, what is that? And then I realized after a while, in thinking backwards, that it's a really important part of being an American to actually realize that we're all pilgrims, basically, and that and that, that is the regenerative power of, of uh, this country. And I thought a few years ago we were beginning to lose that because we were beginning to realize that, you know, that was then, but now it's different. It's not. And so I started speaking out a lot more about the need to kind of find ways that we can fairly bring people into our, our country's kind of... Uh, idea pool, kind of in the form of ideas, approaches. And so I think that's one of them. The other way it's helped me, which I can go into if more if interesting, is that over time I've realized that there's a mindset an immigrant has to have to survive that actually is very, very uh, similar to what innovators need and what entrepreneurs need. Because if you think about it, if you're going to innovate, you're leaving the bounds of what's preceding you. You're attempting to do something that everybody thinks is crazy. Uh, people kind of look at you funny, they make fun of your accent, you know, metaphorically, meaning that you're saying strange things to them. But if you insist and you persist and you adapt and eventually you break through, you then become the native of the new way. And that same journey of that immigrants go through to adapt and to, and to kind of become part of the new reality is what innovators do. I actually think that innovation is basically intellectual immigration. And I think you know, physically, you may not want to immigrate because it's a great country, you don't want to leave. But intellectually, I think everybody can basically adopt an immigrant mindset. What does that mean? You don't take anything for granted. Nothing is owed to you by your country. When you're an immigrant, nothing is owed to you by your host country. I mean, you just don't take anything for granted. You find everything a little bit uncomfortable, just constitutionally, because you don't fit in. And those are great things as an innovator. And I, I do think that you know, one of the things, this may sound controversial to you, but several years ago when there was this intense, intensifying crisis in the country about 
whether our own country was being left behind certain places in the country while other places were advancing. I actually think, ironically, that what we need is an immigrant mindset across our whole country. Not just in immigrants, but everybody. Because what that means is you have to be able to put in the effort, put in the survival kind of risk-taking to be able to advance and not wait for the country to do it. And so those are all things that I just find interesting parallels. And, and I hope at least that point of view, together with a lot of other points of view, make for a better country. Mm -hmm. So speaking of risk-taking, um, you started your first company when you were 24 years old. So what or who inspired you to take that chance um, at that young age? So I'm, I'm very happy to tell you the story, which I've said many times, because I was probably the age of many of the people in this room. And you never know what chance event causes you to kind of completely change the, the, the arc of your life. So in my case, um, I was 22 years old, and I was doing my PhD. And I happened to be sent by folks at MIT to Washington, DC for an NSF National Science Foundation conference. And the conference was not about any particular field. It was about competitiveness. So this was the time when everybody was afraid in the US that Japan was going to overtake the US in, in technology, and there was a lot of fear. <coughs> Excuse me. So I ended up going to this thing as kind of a token biotechnology person. Biotechnology was a five-year-old field at the time. There weren't that many people that could go and speak on behalf of biotechnology. So I went there, and by chance, at lunch, I sat next to this gentleman, this big, you know, physically big person, my father's age. And I, I asked him what he did, and I, I mean, I mustered enough courage to do that. And uh, he said that he and another friend of his had graduated as a first generation of engineers called electronic engineers, eventually became electrical engineers, and that they didn't know what to do when they graduated. And so they decided that all their friends were going to design these analog circuits. And they thought, well, why don't we make instruments for their, for their friends, basically, to be able to do whatever they do with electronic engineering. So literally, he described this like this, and they invented these oscilloscopes. And in a garage, they started making them, and then they eventually created a company. This was now in the 40s, late 40s, mm -hmm. you know. And so I listened to the story, and I was thinking in my mind, well, I'm a new breed of engineer, biological engineer. You know, there's no instruments to do what, what our, my colleagues were doing. There's going to be need to make all sorts of new instruments. So I started imagining pretty linearly that maybe this is something that I could do. I wasn't looking for a job. I was not really far along with my PhD, but it was kind of an interesting story. So eventually, I said to him, you know, I kind of asked him what his name was. And it was David Packard from Newton Packard. <laughs> and, and literally, he was telling me this before the, the book H, the HP Way was written. And he was telling me how they started. And what was remarkable was that he was just, you know, that's the thing that stuck with me, is that he's just an, a regular person. Yeah. And unlike, you know, I play basketball, unlike when you see, you know, these phenomenal basketball players where you just physically realize you cannot do that. Yeah. Uh, there was nothing he was saying to me that I thought I couldn't do because this was not physical. It was intellectual, it was hard work, it was risk taking. So the, but the fact that he presented to me in this un, you know, kind of unintimidating way, we're kind of like, hey, you could, and I said to him, well, what would it take to do this? And he said, look, you know, I said, like, people tell me I need a product, I need a technology. He said, you don't need those things. If it's a brand new field, you just dive in. Whatever you do will be valuable. You'll find your way. So don't get too obsessed over having the best idea. Just kind of like announce yourself in it. You know, whatever you invent, you can cut. So, and I took a lot of courage from that. I talked to him for a couple of hours, came back, started taking courses. There weren't courses in entrepreneurship back in the mid-80s. There weren't courses in lots of things. But I kind of got a little exposure to technology and management, innovation, isn't that? And then I started a company in 87 when I finished my grad to do exactly what he was doing, make instruments for the biotech industry. And along the way, learned kind of by doing. Um, by 89, 90, the company had begun to make actually and sell products, instruments uh, like to separate proteins, my spectrometry instruments to analyze them. These are all breakthrough things at the time. And that company grew to be a pretty sizable player. We were about 110 million in annual revenues at the end, about 900 people, public for five years. And that's kind of, for the first 10 years of my career, that's how I learned how to do kind of what I call startupology. Because sometimes this whole startup world is taken a little too seriously. And, you know, like astrology, I kind of sometimes want to kind of remind people that there's a lot of a lot of stuff in there that's just kind of you learn by doing, and so that, those were the early days. Yeah. So, as one of the first PhDs in this new field of biotechnology, did you have any you know, envision what this industry was going to become, or where it would go? You know, not, not really, and certainly not precisely. Uh, and and I may I come back and say what I mean by precisely. So. <laughs> 
I'd say it was clear that the pharmaceutical industry had been had developed in the prior 50 years based on the chemical industry. So, you know, in world wars, people were beginning to use whatever chemical they could to fight diseases. Mm -hmm. Initially, used to be dye based, and eventually started becoming antibiotics from nature. And 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 it, then the most recent approach to pharmaceuticals in the 70s were kind of synthetic chemistry, just kind of make made up substances. And we were just beginning to find out how our body works at the molecular cellular level. I mean, literally, none of this was known. And even in the early 80s, you knew two or three important proteins, but you didn't know that there's 100,000 different proteins that cells do what they. So you could imagine that as this was becoming that as this was becoming uh, deciphered, more and more knowledge about diseases could lead to more and more discoveries of drugs. But that's about the level of specificity mm -hmm. that I could imagine. You know what's happened in the 34 years since then is was quite unimaginable, but it did tell me that at the end of the day, if you're at the frontier of a of a space that's just opening up, it will likely go that way. Especially if it's got impact on the on the world the way saving lives does, or or, or, or helping people live better lives. That's a pretty big unmet need, just like carbon, just like so. There's a few areas where you know major breakthrough or shifts are opportunities, even without actually envisioning how it's going to play out. So many entrepreneurs um, follow a path that's called serial entrepreneurship, right? So they move from one project to the next. Um, but can you explain how your approach to entrepreneurship differs? So, um, sure. So, you know, when I started out, I spent the first five, six years on this one project, and then by the mid '90s, um, for reasons I don't I don't quite know, other than attention deficit, I started thinking, you know, like is, is this the only thing I'm ever going to do? And I wasn't at all drawn to the notion I got to leave what I'm doing to do something else, because interestingly, when you look at the investment side of the startup world, venture capital, they do many many things at the same time, and I was always drawn to the the diversity, the, the diversification meaning your risk mitigation, all of those things were attractive to me, except entrepreneurs were supposed to do one thing for a really long time and sink or swim with it. So as, even as the first company, Perceptive Biosystems, was growing, I started realizing that we had things in our labs that were basically not going to go anywhere inside this company because it had set a direction and these were distractions. Mm -hmm. So I started spinning out these things into standalone companies, mm -hmm. raising money for them. And so that was kind of a form of what I used to call parallel entrepreneurship. Meaning, you don't, as an entrepreneur, you don't want to think of this as a solo act. These are team activities. And so the idea was, could I form teams that could go after different aspects of this? And so I experimented with that. There was a company we spun out called Chemgenics Pharmaceuticals. This was, again, in the mid-'90s. That ended up being acquired. We created a vaccine company back in the mid-'90s for cancer. That ended up going public. And so I started realizing that, actually, you can do this. And the more of this that I was experimenting with, the more I realized, these things are not completely different from each other. I mean, there's some core principles. You know, you still need great people. You still need intellectual property. You still need an unmet need. So that encouraged me in the in by '99, 2000, having done five of these now, in addition to the primary first company, to create a, a, a platform to do parallel entrepreneurship, which is what my current company, Flagship Pioneering, is all based on. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about flagship pioneering. Why do you use the term pioneering? Do you liken your scientists or professionals to be like traditional pioneers, or? Let me kind of step back and say what it is we do, because it's a little bit of an unusual kind of uh, 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 experiment. So there's two experiments we're trying to run at flagship simultaneously. One is, could you create companies through teams, through process, through an institution, instead of through individual startups. That's the kind of regular way in which startups happen. And, and I don't suggest that it's a better way, it's just a different way. Mm -hmm. And the question is, if you were going to do that, how would it operate? How do, you, how do you incent people? What kind of people do you need? So that's one experiment. The second experiment, which is where the pioneering part comes from, is that we realized after doing this in a few years that we were able to create companies quite reproducibly, quite effectively, but they were working on things that other people were working on too. And, and one of the things that uh, we, I became very concerned about is that kind of the way innovation happens, it's a really crowded space. As soon as one person has a good idea, 70 people are working on the same idea. 
and, and, and I don't for a minute believe that we can out-execute, out-charm, out-sell, out-anything people. So I really wanted us to figure out, can we out-innovate people? Mm -hmm. And the only way you can out-innovate them is not in quantity of innovation, but in the distance of innovation from what the present has. So we decided to come up with, and we have been working on this for years, a way by which we could make leaps of innovation, not uh, adjacency-oriented innovations. So what I mean by that is we decided that, okay, so the world is exploring whatever is the next likely thing. But there's no way to explore the next, next, next thing. The reason is because nobody will give you money for it. Nobody will join your project because it seems way too risky. And yet, if you happen to find something that will be the next, next, next thing, then you could imagine it could be very valuable and you could own it. I mean, you could be there first. You could come up with the language by which the world works there. You could patent it, etc. So we needed to create a, a methodology, which we have done over the years, which, which some people may be interested in. Um, and, and that methodology, we think, gives us the ability to dare to be first in category in every single company that we're creating. Mm -hmm. By pioneering, that's what we mean. Pioneering, in, in, a, in a way, has many different meanings. But the ecological meaning of a pioneering species is the first species that goes into a barren land and makes it inhabitable. It's the same way in which it's used to describe pioneers who work on rest, etc. So it's this notion that you're not following anybody into a space, you're the first into the space, and you make it hospitable to others eventually. Mm -hmm. That kind of uh, uh, idea was very appealing to us because that's how it felt. We'd land something like Moderna mRNA, which I'm sure we'll talk about, was that 10 years ago, 11 years ago, it was a completely unreasonable, kind of detached from reality concept. Mm -hmm. Perfect for what we wanted to do. Because we thought, okay, if we can bring it to reality, we can pretty much own it. Uh, it may not be uh, real, realistic, in which case, that's one of many things we're doing. Yeah. So, your company seems to focus on health and agriculture, more those that have a societal impact, really. Is that if, if, if your exclusive focus? Are you exploring any new areas of investment that are outside of those areas with flagship? So, flagship, so I'll talk about areas, but important to understand that we're not, our, 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 uh, our firm is not an investment firm in the sense that we only provide capital to the projects we invent, we own, and we develop. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing external that we are looking for. So when there are these new trends, new companies, startups, etc., we're unfortunately not the right source of capital for them. There's very rich source of capital elsewhere, but that's not, not us. Having said that, where do we apply our, uh, our methodology to? And it is in health, but broadly, and in sustainability. We have historically worked in other areas of sustainability, for example, renewable energy, uh, and, and we have kind of de-emphasized that, not because of the lack of need, but because of the, the, the kind of societal impediments to actually be able to make a difference there. It turns out it costs billions of dollars and, and regulatory changes to enable renewable energy, and so that was a bit beyond our pay grade. You know, maybe the world needs it again now. Uh, in agriculture, we got into this area because it was very much biology, chemistry driven. Uh, that's a science we feel comfortable. Those are sciences we feel comfortable. The area which is kind of pulling us uh, uh, into itself, if I can call it that, much more these days is machine learning and artificial intelligence. It's been about five years we've worked heavily in this area. We used to work in this area 10, 15 years ago because this is not a new area. But it's an area that's become kind of much more enabled by, by some of the deep learning approaches. And we are very, very interested in that as it relates to enabling major leaps. Because a lot of things that, as humans, we cannot um, conceive, you can conceive using these systems. And the question becomes, what can be conceived using these systems? Can you now make them valuable? And how do you do that? So we're, we're exploring those. But we're not broadly into technology for the sake of technology. We're very specific to what we'll do. Yeah. So let's talk about Moderna. I think some people want to hear a little bit about that. Um, oh, no. So, um, you, know, you know, when you, when you started with that company, did you have any idea what it would become? Um, I think uh, contemporaneous evidence would suggest that we thought it would become a major disruptive company in the biotech industry. The problem was not what we thought. The problem was what everybody else thought. <laughs> because what we were saying seemed, I'll use a word that might sound 
kind of crazy but fantastical, you know, like my yeah. kids use that word. And and you know, of course that is by design. Let me let me just interject one thing just for you guys to think about and then I'll come back to it. So I'll make a, once in a while I might go on a bit of a rant, so let me just make one small rant here. I did make a bit of an immigrant rant, let me tell you about the rant. Because a lot of you are students. So I would argue that we for, for a species that wants to solve world problems with innovation, we're fairly anti-imagination. Let me explain what I mean. So we, we go to school, we gather knowledge, we learn how to learn, we learn reasoning tools to apply the knowledge. But all of that excludes our ability to imagine. In the arts, we're allowed to imagine. But in science, you know, we got to come up with hypotheses that are falsified, that are completely based on the prior hypotheses. When we publish papers, we've got to show 75 references of all the other. Where is room for imagination in that? Imagination, if you went to a scientific meeting and said something imaginary, people would laugh at you. There's a good reason, by an analog, look at literature. How many Nobel Prizes were given to science fiction writers? They're considered unserious people, generally. Science fiction is not considered a big part of literature. That's crazy. Well, not because I like science fiction. I actually don't particularly like science fiction. But as a genre, but what it is is that we've been given, as humans, we've evolved the capability to imagine. That's the first step of leaping. The second step is belief. The ability to believe that you have end. But the first is imagination. And I would argue that broadly our education system roots out our ability to imagine. It discourages it. Because the first question is, why should I believe what you said? Well, if I have to defend what I said and what I said I just made up, then I can't defend what I said. Therefore, I shouldn't say it, lest I look unscholarly. Un, un. So I can tell you from one person, if you take nothing away from today, ask yourself when's the last time in your regular day you used imagination in your studies, in your thinking about your future. And if you see yourself subliminally suppressing it, and I hope you're not, but maybe I'm the only one in the room who has this problem. But trust me, growing up, we're all kind of gradually taught not to use that muscle. And, and I think if we can use imagination, so Moderna was a product of imagination. We imagined, as one of many, many projects we were working on, not the only one, the possibility that there could be, we didn't know how, a molecule that if you stick into a patient's body, could make any protein we want. Why did we imagine this? Because we know that every cell in your body has the wherewithal to make any protein it wants. Every protein that it has a DNA code for. So we thought, why aren't we making drugs in our own bodies instead of making them in along the Charles River in that big, you know, factory that you've seen, the Genzyme factory? Why? What is that? It's like a billion, two billion dollar factory to make things that every cell in your body knows how to do. I mean, I'm simplifying. So the question then became, like, hold that thought. Instead of, how are you going to do that? You don't know how to do that. Why are you wasting my time telling me something that's a fantasy? Fantasy, I'm going to tell you. Just use fantasy, right? Science fiction pretty much predicts everything that happens. If you go look at it, there's very little that we're doing that isn't in some, yeah. you know, I was watching Dune the other day, and I was like completely blown away that in 1965, somebody wrote so many things that for 30 years after everybody put into their, both reality and their movies, uh, this capability we have. So, that, so what you do instead, if you're able to imagine, take this leap, we were talking about the history of this college a little bit, it's a leap of faith, actually. It's an interesting concept, leap of faith. We use this word to mean different things, but it really involves some level of faith in your ability to land and create value. So we imagined, okay, we said, how would you do it? If you knew you could do it, how would you do it? So we started looking at DNA, RNA, viruses, lots of different molecules. We found out that RNA would probably be the most interesting molecule for reasons that I don't have time to get into. And then we said, why isn't this being done? And step by step by step, kind of almost going from the future backwards, yeah. right? we started filling in the technological gaps needed to go present forward to where we want to end up. That was what exactly Moderna did. Now, Moderna did this over 10 years, right? So when COVID hit, Moderna was a 700-person company with 17 programs that were already in human testing. So the world never didn't know about it. So when they found out about it, they said, oh, what's this company has never even made a single product that's gonna... The answer is we spent two and a half billion dollars, 10 years, 700 people at the end, perfecting the platform that we then have to apply to an unsuspecting virus and hope to defeat it. That's kind of what happened. But, mm -hmm. but, the, but, the, but the belief was in the platform and in this general idea that there could be molecules that could instruct your body what to do. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm curious, 
so the scientists in the room, or the biologists in the room, um, wanted to know if you're going to use that platform, an RNA platform, um, for potentially coming up with uh, individualized cancer vaccines. So is that something that Moderna would do, or? So Moderna has been working on individualized cancer vaccines for five years, mm -hmm. and has already been testing it and has continued to test it in humans long again before COVID came. So unbeknownst to people, just because it's not a, you know, it's not a, it's not Google, it's not Facebook, it's not, it's not social media where you can find out what they're doing and the whole world's paying attention to it. We were just doing it in our labs. Uh, in addition to that, we had eight other vaccines that we were testing, our mRNA versions of it before COVID. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things people don't realize is that back in 2015, the very first mRNA that we ever tested in humans as a vaccine were against two strains of influenza that are bird flu strains mm -hmm. that have not yet been in humans. Yeah. Why? Because we want to be ready for a pandemic. Because when those strains get into humans, they definitely will cause a pretty serious epidemic, maybe mm -hmm. a pandemic. And so, ironically, we had already tested it, not in a coronavirus case, yeah. but in an influenza case. So, yes, we're working on vaccines and we'll continue to cancer both vaccines and therapies, but also cardiovascular drugs. So, right after a, a, a heart attack, you can literally inject mRNA for a molecule called VEGF, and that molecule will get uh, stem cells in your heart muscle to start producing new cardiomyocytes, which will be able to get the heart from the damage to become reversed. That's in phase three trials, entering phase three trials now. Uh, rare genetic diseases, many, many of them. So where this ends up 10 years, 20 years from now, who knows? But we're, I think Moderna said publicly, we have 34 different development programs that are advancing. Probably five of them will read out over the next three, four years, and then they'll lead to the next wave and the next wave after that. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on how we can prevent a pandemic from happening? Another pandemic, or any lessons learned from COVID-19 that you applied to your... In two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, hide, no. Um, the only answer is hide, yeah. Uh, well, so there's a lot of things that we could learn if we chose to learn them. Um, I worry that we won't learn them because you know a lot of our existence has become so kind of in the moment. You know the new cycle just keeps kind of like waves washing away the last new cycle, and the last is very very hard to 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 kind of hang on to the major learnings. Mm -hmm. I hope it doesn't happen because five million people have lost their lives. Over this, over this pandemic, and the notion that they would just be a memory, a distant memory in the new cycle six months from now would be an unbelievable shame. And as we sit here today with masks on, it might seem unbelievable, but just you wait, because the way social media works, the way the world works today, people are on to the next problem and the next challenge, and they almost don't want to feel the anguish of worrying about something, so they just kind of erase it. Uh, having said that, I do think that this experience should cause humanity to ask a very simple question, which is, what do we mean by healthcare? What do our countries owe us? And I would argue, just to be a bit blunt, that what we call healthcare is actually sick care. Because the way you know that is that you gotta get sick to get any of it. You can't go if you're healthy and say, give me some healthcare, right? They'll, they'll just send you home, they'll do a couple of tests, so you're fine, go home. But, but when you're sick, it's often too late because the first, you, you don't get to decide you know, how sick you are. So by the time a disease manifests and all of a sudden you have stage three cancer, there's not much we're gonna do about, about this uh, anytime soon because it's a complex disease that's already taken hold. So we gotta move upstream, upstream, upstream. The problem is, the more upstream it is, the harder it is to detect. And the harder it is to prove you did something about it. Because it wasn't, it's like your car. Right? If your car is completely busted, then if somebody fixes it, you know. But if it's a little bit misaligned, gradually it's going to cause you a crash, it's very hard to show that what you did actually saved. So that's, that's an important concept. But I'd say in a, long, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a short kind of summary, I think we need to think about health as a matter our governments owe us the security of, not the care of. So if your, your physical security in this room is actually a right you have that's being assured by the government, you're paying taxes, you have police, you have laws, you have the military, you have counterterrorism, 
All these things give you physical security. That's why we can be here today without worrying that somebody's going to shoot us or hit us or whatever, right? Yeah. But who's protecting our health? Basically, nobody. Right? You can say, oh, but we took childhood vaccines. Just watch how much we don't want to take any vaccines. So health protection is itself not part of our conscience. We can have fluoride in the water. And so people say, oh, yeah, does that mean we need public health? The problem with just public health is that that's kind of a... If it's like building a wall, meaning that it's just one size fits all. What I think we need in the future is a form of preemptive medicine. We need to go find the preconditions to disease, be able to treat those preconditions, hold the disease at bay, delay it, deter it, derail it, do whatever you want to do, but don't wait for disease to take hold. A, a society that puts money into that, I think we'll have much more affordable health care when you're sick than a society that doesn't. And we just saw that with the pandemic, yeah. right? The biggest thing that the pandemic showed us is that our underlying health condition dictates how badly we, can, we get affected by the by infection. So most of the people who died had underlying serious health conditions. Well, did society actually protect them? Not really. They were, with these health conditions, completely vulnerable to this infection, and the infection got them first. Now, if you're not one of them, you'd say, well, thank God I'm not one of them. But sorry, folks, you will be. Just give it a few years, you will be. Because we're not any more protected from these health conditions than those people were. Mm -hmm. So age gives you those preconditions, in addition to other things that you might have genetically. So I really, really hope that politicians and universities and like start realizing that we have to demand health security. And if you said, why the government, why can't private, uh, the, you know, private companies do this? The answer is, this is a heavily regulated industry. If you went today to the FDA and said, I want a pretreatment for a pre-disease, they'll throw you out. There's no such thing. They'll say, come back when you have a disease. I'll need a disease and I'll, sh and I'll get a drug approved. Not a good idea when it comes to infectious disease. Not a good idea when it comes to cancer either. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Um, so, is there any advice you wish you had had, perhaps as an undergraduate, or any advice you want to share with the students in the room about what they should be doing um, in the future, or just in general? Boy, well, I, well, my advice is, is, uh, is worth what you pay me, which is not so don't, don't take it, don't take it uh, very seriously. But there's a look, there's, I've already said a few things. First of all, you know, I have a, I have a little... One time I was down at Cape Cod in one of these stores that sell these wooden things. You can imagine. I always wonder who buys these things and I buy about them. And one of them, one of them says, trust your crazy ideas. And I bought this like 25 years ago and I have it behind my desk because, you know, if you, if you think that breakthroughs come from smart people who have smart ideas, you're, you're dead wrong. Breakthroughs are emergent and they are the result of many, many generations of iteration of prior ideas and prior ideas, and eventually, at some point, they gain an advantage. And if you happen to be there, you get to tell the world how, how genius you are. And so, but it's just not how it happened. So first thing is, you cannot dismiss things that are not beautifully born genius ideas. They are, every one of your crazy ideas could be the ancestor of a breakthrough idea. But most people abandon them, because they, they look at it and they go, ah, this is no good, let me move on to the next one. So that's one, first of all, that's what I believe. Second is kind of you have to realize that you know trying to do new things will expose you to a lot of criticism, a lot of skepticism. Your family and friends will tell you just go get a real job. And so there's a lot of people who care for you will tell you not to do this, and and maybe you shouldn't. But if you decide to, nobody's going to stop telling you those things. So you cannot kind of like feel bad for yourself. That's partly the immigrant mindset. Um, Maybe the last thing I'll say is, I, I've kind of, in looking back for many, many years, because I've been involved in teaching entrepreneurship and, and innovation at MIT and our business school for the last 20 years, and I've had to, when you teach, you have to kind of think about what you're saying versus just doing it. And one of the things that a lot of times people ask you is, what's the mindset? What's the mindset that people have? And my best description of a mindset, if you want to be in a life of innovation and entrepreneurship, is basically one of paranoid optimism, which is kind of something that I've long thought uh, uh, is important. So Andy Grove wrote this book many years ago, a famous book called Only the Paranoid Survive. But I would say only the paranoid optimists thrive. Because if you are, if you are just an optimist, 
you'll kind of get reckless and you'll believe your own assumptions and when they're wrong, you're dead. If you're only paranoid, you'll quickly get depressed that you can't act because you don't know if your assumptions are right and you just can't. But if you can toggle between the two, like a gas pedal and a brake pedal, mm -hmm. constantly doubting yourself, constantly believing yourself, constantly that, and you add a little element of urgency, right? But also patience. And what I mean by urgency is an orientation. Patience is kind of what makes your urgency sufferable a little bit. These are all things that you kind of have to come up with yourself and make, make peace of with yourself. It's not a comfortable existence, by the way. Um, you'd rather be accepted. You'd rather have people think, what you're doing is definitely going to work. You want affirmation. That's the other thing. Maybe the last thing I'll say. I had, you know, unfortunately, my kids are not here or watching this, but I had three daughters that went down the street at the Windsor School. And I used to drive them to school. That was one of my one luxury of my life was that I could drive them every day. And I used to talk to them. And I realized as they grew up that one of the things that they were just developing on their own is an incredibly sophisticated system to avoid disappointment. It is very deeply rooted. Like this is kind of like the evolution of our character is how do you avoid disappointment? And I realized, in fact, I can't do very much to bring them up well, but that was the one thing I used to do, which is to interfere with that. And I used to basically tell them disappointment is overrated. Just like if you collect a lot of disappointment, you're getting one, close, one step closer to appointment. There's no such word, but the opposite of disappointment. <laughs> but if you avoid disappointment by everything you do, you don't take a shot because you don't think it'll go in, you don't try out for a team because you don't think they'll make it, and you just don't want the indignity of being rejected, mm -hmm. oh my god, are you boxing yourself into a pretty small space. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I mean, just ask somebody who sells for a living. Right? To me, the most difficult job in the world is salesmen. Because they're rejected all the time. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they make peace with the fact that every rejection gets you closer to acceptance. And these are not just kind of like, you know, sayings. This is this reality. So just experiment with it. So find a place where you can do something that is risks disappointment and just kind of like make fun of it. Don't take yourself too seriously. I really, really think that disappointment is overrated. At some point, when you're complaining to somebody about this or that and the other thing, if you just remind yourself that maybe all I'm doing is avoiding disappointment, I think you'll find that new opportunities will show up in your life. And that's, so that's one thing that, that I've learned. And by the way, it's not easy to do. You have to constantly be playing a game with your life, with your mind, of saying, no, 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 don't worry about this point, but it's okay, the next one. But if you learn how to do that almost as a, as a personal habit trait, I think you'll find pretty interesting. <coughs> um, and I know we have some students that would like to ask a few questions with our remaining few minutes. We just have a few minutes left. So if I may, um, I think Marlis, do you want to kick us off here? Good evening. That's right. Oh, I can hear you. Good evening, Dr. Ambrayan. Uh First, I would like to express my deepest gratitude for protecting me, my family, and the entire world with your revolutionary vaccine. Now, I believe that core values form the foundation of one's life and greatly determine the choices that one makes. What do you believe to be your core values? How did they develop? And how have they impacted your life's work? That's a tough question. <laughs> In two minutes. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't have a canned answer to that because I don't do too many of these types of things. And you know, I, I kind of embody some of these values and what I've been trying to share with you, embody them. But I don't have kind of like a set of two or three things. But I'll tell you one of the one, of, one that I can at least talk about a little bit, which is embodied in a humanitarian project that I started many years ago, and it's the foundation of that, but it's also what I believe, which is this notion of gratitude in action, right? So I feel like everything I'm doing is through the sacrifice of other people. I, for example, happen to be a second generation survivor of a genocide, right? And it's always in my great aunt that I grew up with from the, the day I was born till I was 20 years old, basically lived through that, and her brothers were taken away to be killed. So she was first kind of witness to what happened. So happens that my grandfather was saved, saved by German soldiers in the middle of World War I when the Germans were perpetrating and helping some of these activities. Now, what do I do with that 100 years later? The answer is I realized, but for the grace of somebody who helped my grandfather, I wouldn't exist. But for the grace of doctors who helped me, various issues that I had. Or, so when you realize that you're just kind of enabled by others, you develop a sense of gratitude. And the question is, 
how do you put that gratitude into what you do, into your actions? Whether it's through philanthropy, whether it's through volunteerism, whether it's through just talking to people and giving them your perspective so that it'll open up their minds. So that's one of the kind of values that I've kind of put a lot of at least effort and thought into. But I think your question was more general, kind of like how do I, uh, of what do I live by? I don't have a kind of a, a quickie answer to that, unfortunately, sorry to disappoint you. But <laughs> I, I really hope that ultimately what I do will kind of indicate what I believe in and maybe give it a little bit of time and have a better answer to it next time. Thank you so, so much. Um, we're all so happy to have you here and to join the whole world, like Marilla said. As a fellow Armenian, um, I know that you've done a lot of work in Armenia, a lot of work that you were uh, alongside with the pandemic. Armenia did go through wars, you know, and uh, there was a lot of political turmoil. Is there any projects you're currently working on or aid missions that you're working on right now that you'd like to share with you? Sure. So because it's a but it's kind of a particular question in the sense that it has to do with a tiny little place in the world. But it's indicative of what others can do everywhere else in the world. So first of all, the, the, there, there's a, a region that is, that is uh, uh, near Armenia where there, there was both a conflict and a war. And so as a result of that, there was a lot of need for humanitarian assistance. So first, we set up a, a, an activity in Artsakh to, to provide quite substantial, several hundred projects were undertaken to give people jobs and rebuild their houses, etc. So we, we've been involved in that. More broadly, though, Armenia as a country is among the very many countries in the world that are in between object poverty and a little better than that. And they're kind of stuck because they can't, they don't have the resources to solve today's problem. And they can't imagine a future unless they solve current problems. And therefore, they're stuck. And there, we've done years and years, and we're doing a lot of work now, in trying to work on what could be a possible future for the country, sufficient for people not to leave the country, and sufficient people to get education to work towards that future. So it's this project we call Future Armenian that we launched about a year ago. It's got 15 different goals, as, just similar to the SDG <coughs> and the UN. And, and we're thinking that we have to kind of find a way to focus people's minds on what is possible, such that they can make the sacrifices to be able to get to that. And so some of it is, kind of social support, social service, some of it is education, some of it is just jobs, but also equity in society, opportunity. So there's a bunch of different specific initiatives we're taking. Uh, in Armenia has been an interesting place because it's been a tiny little microcosm of what's possible broadly in the world. And then through, but outside Armenia, through the Aurora Project, any of you who are interested in any of these activities, there's a Aurora humanitarian initiative uh, that is global, not just based in Armenia. There we've been able to reach literally many, many countries with kind of refugee assistance and stuff. So, so just different ways to, you know, I'd say one thing I, I would tell people if you're sitting there listening, oh, wouldn't it be great to have money to give to these places? I, it's money is not the biggest thing I've given to these places. For 20 years, I've gone to Armenia five, six times a year. Uh, and, and, and on the ground, have tons of people who are actually working on projects. And the biggest thing you can do is actually personal involvement. In fact, I only generally give money to the things I personally involved with me, substantial amounts, as opposed to charity where I'm just kind of, you know, fulfilling a, a sense of duty I have. But, but actually, if you can get involved, you can actually see what might be the right ways to go. So lots and lots of different uh, activities. We probably have time for one last question. Yeah, get one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you whether it's education or health care, it's probably health care, whether it's education. I would like to know what you want to give your mind to. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, education is one of these things where there's an infinite number of things that need attention, need improvement, need experimentation. I tend to be kind of more drawn towards doing things in an unprecedented way. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I'd say that kind of experiments that are not yet been run just because of you know, my nature are are more interesting. I think that's so, you know, I've been, as, as was mentioned, I've been involved at MIT where some of the things that I've been supporting are, for example, an initiative which called SOLVE, which is basically a global development social impact uh, uh, program that brings hundreds and hundreds of applicants with novel solutions to challenges in the world together with a scientific engineering community 
who can kind of weigh in on those, out of which a handful of projects are chosen to advance both as an educational tool, real world problems, solving real improving lives, but as well a way to create companies or nonprofits that can advance those. So that's been, you know, that's experiential education, but it's part of an educational campaign. But that's so, I mean, I understand the nature of your question. There's education is a, education is really the biggest gift people can give because at the end of the day, it's got a very long, in fact, you know, being touched by the understanding that you have to learn how to learn, more so than just learning, is the biggest gift you can, you can give. And, and it's, it's, it's easy to, to assume that you gotta just suffer through learning and then be done with it and just live. But actually, you know, this, the, what you're getting here is an appreciation of how to learn. And most of what you're gonna learn, you'll learn outside of here, even if you learn a lot here. And so I think <laughs> getting that reinforced to people uh, is, is another important thing. Thank you very much. Well, we really appreciate um, your insight and your commitment to the future of health and sustainability. So on behalf of the entire...